I want to first of all thank uh, Vishal for encouraging me to do this. Uh, you know, when he first told, told me about this, I said, you know, it, it, I think it's a great idea. It allows me to kind of think through all my experiences and share them with you. Uh, I want to thank Yasha for all the logistics and over the last several weeks to just help me prepare to get this done. So, so thank you to both of you. Um, I don't uh, pretend to be an academic, so uh, what you're about to see in this presentation uh, will have things that you will have access to books and professors who can give you a lot more scientific and more uh, detailed definitions and things like that. Think of this as a, a practitioner's guide. So someone who's you know worked at companies at brands, I'm trying to share with you uh, my thoughts and experiences and Think of it as a, as a thought starter, as you're going through your projects, as, as you're going back to your companies, as you think about brand marketing, uh, just use this as a practitioner's guide. Uh, so you may disagree with things in here and that's totally fine. You'll find better sources, that's totally fine. Uh, and the last thing I just wanna mention is that uh, we're in really in, in, uh, in very unusual times, right? So this pandemic is, is changing a lot of uh, thinking around brand. And uh, you know, while we were already in the digital age and things were uh, <clears throat> you know, very moving along very rapidly, uh, we're continuing to be agile and brands are now having to think even more uh, clearly about what they're going to kind of come out of this pandemic as and how they're going to position themselves. So I think it's a very, uh, you know, if you think about just a brand like Zoom, you know, six months ago, we weren't talking about Zoom and it's probably one of the most mentioned brands right now. We're all talking Zoom. So uh, it, it just goes to show that there, there are times of change. Uh, and, and so a lot of what you see here may have held true and that's the challenge for brand marketers is to keep continuously kind of adapting to what the current situations are right so let me go to the next slide and if i understand the format uh, we do about a 45 minute presentation and then if you have questions we'll we'll go from there i know it's a saturday night for all of you so i'm going to try and keep it light uh, i want it to be interactive feel free to kind of keep your questions if you don't get a chance to ask your question, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd love to hear from people. I'd love to hear your thoughts at the end of this as well. Um, so this whole uh, presentation, uh, I'm gonna go through four things. I'm gonna start with a little bit of an introduction of myself so you understand where my perspective is coming from. Uh, I'll walk you through some brand basics uh, because I understand that many of you come from various backgrounds. Uh, you know, many of you are technologists and engineers, and I'm not sure you're living a brand or marketing on a daily basis. So I'll just go through some very basic brand principles. Uh, I'll get into a little more detail on brand positioning. And I'll take you through a couple of case studies uh, from my experience that that will hopefully bring it to life and, and give you some kind of uh, a context to what I'm talking to you about. So on the right there, you see, uh, I, I put kind of the list of companies I've worked for um, since the start of my career. Um, as Yasho mentioned, I, you know, I was born in Bombay. I've, I've traveled, I've moved a lot, I've been uh, very fortunate to have lived and studied and worked in many companies around the world. Um, and my career really started after finishing my BCom in Bangalore uh, and in Bombay with uh, Raymond. And I, by the way, it's always Bombay for me. It's hard for me to kind of get around to saying Mumbai. But, uh, and I worked for Raymond and, uh, you know, worked there for a couple of years. And then I went to the U.S. for my MBA in aviation management, worked for a consulting firm uh, called Martin Labby Associates uh, in, in Florida. Uh, then when I moved on to United Airlines, where I spent eight years, uh, did a stint at Citigroup, um, and, and then went to UPS. Actually, in between, I worked for Boeing. I left Boeing, went to UPS, and then came back to Boeing. So uh, the reason I'm telling you this is, is not to kind of show off all the things I've done. It's to tell you that I've got a broad range of perspective from 
uh, what I when I think back about even Raymond, right? I learned a lot of things from what happened at Raymond. They managed their brand really well. Uh, if you think about how they positioned, even when I was back, back there uh, in in you know the late '80s, and I know they still manage their brand very carefully. How they position, I think uh, there's a lot I've picked up along the way. Um, there are examples in here of B two B, B two C. Uh, very small companies, Martin Labby Associates was 25 people, right? So I went from literally 25 people consulting firm where, you know, we were building our own, uh, you know, tables and chairs, we would assemble it ourselves to the largest airline in the world, you know, so uh, how brand is managed in different size of companies um, and, and the ones, you know, premier brands like UPS, Boeing, Citigroup, how careful they are in managing their asset is is something that I've picked up along the way. So it's back to this point about being a practitioner, and uh, it's my experiences at, at all these places. So um, I don't. I'm, I'm going to try and keep this as interactive as possible. So uh, let's start up with a warm up exercise. I'm going to ask all of you to quickly. And by the way, this isn't scientific. Top of mind, just put in the chat what you consider to be the most valuable brand in the world. Just, just type what comes to mind. Great, I'm seeing a couple already. Apple. Just give it 10 seconds. Don't worry if you don't get to it. Microsoft, Google, Coca-Cola, BMW, P&G, Walmart, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Hulu, Rolls-Royce, Apple. Perfect. Tata, Disney, Adidas, Mahatma Gandhi, great, great examples here. Ferrari, Google, Alphabet, Tesla, Zoom. Perfect. That's, that's all I wanted. I wanted to get a mindset, and this is just a warm-up exercise for all of you. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Uh, to get you all into this mindset of what we're about to talk about, right? So, uh, these are you, Rolex, I'm seeing Lamborghini, so great, great examples. Uh, I am going to now just go to the next slide. Let's see if I get this to move. There you go. So what I went and grabbed is uh, the list of the world's most valuable brands. All right, this is from uh, Forbes. It was, uh, it came out in January. So it's kind of a pre pandemic list, if you want to call it that. Uh, and, and all of you are spot on, right? So you've got Apple, Google, Microsoft, and by the way, it's in order. Uh, the top 12, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Coca-Cola, Walt Disney, uh, you've got uh, Samsung, Louis Vuitton, Microsoft, Toyota, and Intel. Uh, so those are the top 12. Now, the point I made earlier is uh, this one is based on, uh, you know, they met each of these lists, and we love lists, right? Everybody loves to know who's on the top and who's, uh, everyone has a different methodology. So I'm not going to try to dissect the methodology and say, is this the right way to look at it? Uh, there's a company called Brand Finance uh, that puts out brand valuations out of the UK. Um, and, and they have Amazon at the top, right? At number one um, at $220 billion. And, and so you see a lot of the movement, but you'll see the same group of you know, all the names that many of you are rattling off will be in these top brands. Uh, so when you put this up you know there's there are a couple of observations that i want to kind of you know point out to all of you which uh which is very apparent but it's worth talking about um almost all of them are global right you you look at them um th these are large global brands um and i actually actually point out brand finance uh what you see missing on here and in their list you see a lot of chinese companies now i see icbc you've got banks uh Huawei, there's a lot of other brands, global brands that are starting to uh, come into this list. The other interesting point here is um, if I had shown you just that symbol up top left of Apple, uh, I'm sure all of you instantly would know it's Apple or the Facebook icon, right? 
uh, you don't need to spell it out. Everyone knows exactly what that stands for. Um, you also notice colors, right? Vishal will attest to with all his experience with Coca-Cola, you know, even the colors, brands are associated with the color red and, and how uh, crucial it is to manage these assets in a way that's consistent across the globe. Uh, no matter where you are, you, you're always going to associate. And so brands are associated with symbols, icons, with, with colors, uh, red for Coca-Cola, uh, UPS had brown, um, Heineken has green. I mean, it's all very, you know, you associate instantly with, with a brand. Uh, you also notice on here, um, a lot of these are, you know, a mix of, uh, the Intel is probably a great example of a, a classic B2B, but most of these play in mu multiple markets, right? They're in B2B markets and B2C markets. Uh, Intel is not, nobody goes down the street to buy an Intel chip. It's, it's an ingredient brand. It's, it's part of uh, another big brand, you know, you co-market. So uh, brands play in, in, in different spaces and, and different markets. Uh, the other thing that's very apparent here is from the top five is, is the digital thread, right? You, you look at all these companies, it's all about how brand building and, and the digital age is coming together. Uh, when you think about well-established, you know, hundred-year-old brands like Boeing and UPS or BMW, have been around here for hundreds of years. It becomes more apparent how important it is for them to keep repositioning, to be, keep staying relevant uh, to your audiences, right? So that's something that's that's uniquely a challenge for older brands uh, to stay relevant, to stay current. Uh, in this digital age and, and, and be, be kind of uh, always kind of keeping up to uh, speed with where your audiences are, what they're, what they're thinking and they're feeling. Um, the other thing that I'll just point out is, again, like I said, uh, things change, right? So it's not that this snapshot is, is accurate, number one, or you know, the same group of companies may move around, uh, which gets into this idea of uh, reputation. And, and what that means is you're going to have times when things will drop, things will go up, other companies will move up. Uh, Microsoft has made a great move over the last few years, right? Since Satya's taken over. There's, uh, so you're, you're gonna see a lot of movement and, and, and that's, that's another one that, uh, you know, you're always managing to make sure that you're relevant and, and, and uh, you know, uh, staying current. All right, so let me go to the next slide. So um, I, I like to uh, kind of use this, and I've used this before in, in my presentations, is, is this metaphor of a, an iceberg, right? So we've, we've talked about logo advertising, visual identity. Uh, quite often brand is confused with this, right? So when, uh, if you're not kind of in marketing or if you ask an average person, they will, when you say brand, they think of a logo or they think of advertising. And that's true for how brand building used to work because it was all about mass advertising. It was TV. And I, I think this is where digital has truly kind of disrupted, right? Over the last couple of decades with uh, digital and social media, especially, you're now able to kind of uh, really talk to different audiences in different places. So uh, this is kind of the traditional old view of, you know, what brand is or many times confused with, okay, a brand is logo or advertising, or it's the soft side. It's just the, the marketing that's going on. Uh, what I like to kind of uh, think about uh, when I think about brand is, is really what's under the surface, right? It's the unseen elements of a brand. It's, it's everything from vision, purpose, how, you're, how they're differentiating, how they're positioning, their personality, you know, the sum total of your experience with a brand. So every touch point, you know, whether you're selling to a consumer, how you take care of your customers, how you talk to them, uh, the tone, everything counts, right? So. Uh, this is how I like to think about brand. Again, it's it's a metaphor. It's it's the unseen that that really plays a big difference in 
in how you think about a brand and how you kind of engage with a brand. So uh, just keep that in the back of your mind as you're uh, you know, thinking about brands. Uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion about reputation management these days. And, and so I, I, I like to kind of um, tease out a nuance of uh, brand and reputation. And this is how I think about it. Um, what I think about brand, I think brand is a, is a promise, right? I think of brand as a promise. And you'll see this in a lot of textbooks. Uh, and there are many definitions, but this is the one I kind of settle on is, is a promise that a company makes to its stakeholders, right? So it's a, it's a clear way of, here's who I am, here's what I'll deliver to you. And then reputation is almost like your scorecard of, okay, are you, are you keeping that promise? Are you delivering on that promise? And this is where uh, in these days, uh, media is gonna play a role uh, people who provide opinions. So people who have nothing to do with your brand can influence how you are positioned because of the things they say. And so reputation management and crisis management has taken on a significant more importance, right? How you're portrayed, uh, how much do they know about you? Do they have the right facts about what you're doing or what you're saying? And, and how do you kind of make sure all these influencers and people who are talking about you whether they have the right information so it's important to kind of engage with them make sure you're telling them what you do what you stand for uh and 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 be able to kind of uh, convey the positive things about what you're doing so that's that's a little bit about brand and uh reputation uh, the other idea that I think, uh, as you looked at all those brands on the top 12 list, right? Um, another core thought there is, you, you see how much revenue they're generating, right? It's, it is a massive growth engine. So it's an asset that, that needs to be aligned with your business strategy. So uh, where I'm going with this is, it, it's, it's, brand is not something that's, you know, just something to do because it's cool or, it's marketing or the soft side, just let's do a campaign, right? Brand is integral to business growth. And, and I think the companies that do it well, that manage it well, uh, are lockstep with their business strategy. They understand their business strategy and brand is, you know, is, is very much a core part of that. And it allows the business to continue to grow into new marketplaces, to deliver new services, new products. And, and so I think this is a key idea that it has to be aligned to business growth. It's not something that's separate and distinct. That's, you know, just a marketing campaign. It is very much aligned to business growth. Uh, the other key idea is, you know, brand positioning is about differentiating, right? You have choices. Consumers have choices. B2B companies have choices. Branding and brand positioning allows you to separate yourself. This is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is what we deliver. And so that's another key. Uh, you know, now I'm kind of transitioning into brand positioning. Um, and, and so this is another key idea. Uh, so I know I've been talking quite a bit. So here's kind of our next little chat exercise. Uh, by the way, I saw a couple of 10 cents, another great example. Uh, let's try this. What, can you type into your chat? All right, so you see Tata, yeah, I, I say a lot of Tata, SPI, uh, got uh, Reliance, Geo, perfect, thank you. So again, we, we talked about most valuable brands around the world. I'm, I'm asking the question about valuable brands, most valuable brands in India. Uh, and great list, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate uh, your engagement on this. So I'm going to, I see a lot of Tata. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, there are a couple of things that uh, come to, uh, you know, become quite apparent, right? So uh, this is all about perceptions. And, and I asked you for your top of mind thoughts and all of you have quickly, uh, you know, typed in what came into your minds. And yes, we are talking about companies and corporations, and that's what I kind of listed also as the most valuable brands. But if you think about 
uh, brands, they kind of start to take layers, right? You, you can talk about a corporate brand, uh, and then you can start getting into products and services within this branding at that level. So this brand thinking is not just exclusively about companies, um, you know, very much like you have product lines within corporate brands, right? So Boeing builds the Dreamliner, BMW builds, you know, three series and the five series and the seven series. And, and not only do they produce the three series, five series and seven series, they have very distinct positioning around those categories of products and services, right? So three series has a positioning of being the sporty line and five is their business line and seven series is their luxury line. So they have very deliberately and thoughtfully put a lot of positioning around those products and services. You have brands around individuals. Uh, I saw um, Mahatma Gandhi, right? So you've got individuals who your own personal branding, associations, institutions, sporting teams. I mean, when you think about the most valuable sporting teams around the world, um, and even nations, I mean, soft power is another thing that uh, the influence that nations have uh, around the world with their culture, there's a, there's a soft power index uh, that's put out by uh, many companies. Uh, so all of this is just to say that brand thinking filters not just at a company or corporate level, it's a, it, it plays out in multiple dimensions and it's, it's a way of thinking in, in, in how you kind of shape uh, perceptions. So why, why are we doing it? Uh, what are the benefits? Why would anyone spend time with all of this? Uh, we talked about differentiation, right? And so if you have a perception of quality, you have the ability to extract a price premium, right? You want to be able to extract a price premium because people want your products and they believe you're going to deliver on quality. Uh, a traditional B to C company, you know, from CPG or soaps and shampoos to cereal, you're, you're basically, it's all about repurchase intent. You've bought something, you want someone to come back and buy again. So you're trying to drive repurchase intent. For B2Bs, it might be loyalty. It might be recommendation. Would you recommend the brand? You want advocacy, right? And at, it could happen at a community level, at a national level. Uh, loyalty and goodwill are, are critical components. If you think about, um, you know, brands that survive for hundreds of years, uh, they go through crisis. I mean, we've, I've been at my share of crises at, at various some companies I've worked at. And, and I think your most loyal customers, uh, if you've built up a good brand and a good relationship, they're willing to kind of uh, forgive you and then, you know, help you kind of get back on track when you deliver on that promise again. Uh, versus someone who's not loyal to you, they will just switch on price or they will switch on uh, the moment they feel they don't uh, trust you. And it's all about trust. I haven't put it on here, but it's a key component about here is building trust uh, with your audiences. Uh, the last two points are really important as well. It's about attracting talent, right? How you position helps you attract the best talent. Uh, if you looked at that list again, and you think about, you know, Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, they're all going after the same pool of talent of software engineers, right? They're all trying to attract. And so how you attract talent is driven by companies who have positioned well and and know how to kind of um, tell their story about how, you know, what value they bring to, to the whole experience. It attracts investment and shareholders as well. Uh, I'm going to put up here, I don't know how many of you have seen the brand finance list, but um, validates kind of what all of you have put into chat, right? Number one is Tata. Uh, these, this is the top 10 most valuable brands in India. I know it's not very clear. Um, but number one is started at about $20 billion valued. And then you see LIC, Reliance, all the way down to Airtel. Uh, and again, everyone has a different methodology. I think this is a good source for looking at, um, you know, what perceptions are out there. 
And by the way, these lists, you know, their methodologies aren't just based only on perceptions. They do anchor it in revenue and you know, uh, projected earnings. And uh, so there's a lot of quantitative uh, underlying all of this as well. I'm just doing a quick time check to make sure I'm not uh, going over. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so I'm going to kind of uh, go through this fairly quickly. I'm, I'm going to try and um, talk through, uh, it's not a comprehensive list by any stretch, but uh, the kinds of things, the elements that you need to think about as you're developing a brand positioning, right? It's, it's something that a brand marketer or a brand communications team uh, rigorously goes through as they're developing campaigns, as they're thinking through things. Uh, number one is audience. It goes without saying, you need to lock in and know who your target audience is. Who's your target demographic? It sounds easy, and it's perhaps easy when you're thinking about a specific product, right? And, and yes, I'm selling this to X audience. But it can get quickly uh, pretty complex when you're trying to weave in at a corporate level, uh, your customers, you know, think of all your stakeholders, your customers, your employees, uh, your suppliers, your, you know, the communities you work in, uh, you know, all these different audiences, you, you need to talk to them and you've got a different message. And so how do you, you know, you have to think through that for each one of those uh, communications uh, that common positioning, how does it work, right? So uh, that's, that's, that's a lot of work that needs to go into the kind of brand strategy and brand positioning. Uh, the second one is, is how do you reach them, right? Which is now again, back to this whole positioning in a digital age has gotten really complex, right? What's the best channels to communicate? Uh, social media has made it uh, a lot more complicated a lot more, um, you know, you, brands are losing control and how do you, you've lost control because it's not about talking one way, uh, they're having their own conversations about the brand. So uh, that's, that creates a, a distinct set of challenges. Uh, the next few points, uh, you know, humanize and authentic are, are things that are now becoming more and more over the last couple of, uh, you know, decades are, are, are becoming more and more important. Um, people want to engage with, uh, with brands they, they feel they know, they understand, they value, they trust. Um, and, and particularly for, I, I noted here for B2B and technology companies, right? Because um, you look at a, an airplane or you look at something that's high tech um, and you look at the technology and you look at the engineering, but you have to kind of humanize that and say there was a human that built that or the ultimate benefit of, of that product or service. What is it delivering? I think those are the things that, that really kind of help you with your brand positioning. Uh, authenticity is something you'll hear a lot about that, that companies are looking for. Uh, it has to start from the inside out. So in other words, what I'm trying to say there is it's not about, um, a marketing team or a, uh, an advertising campaign, right? Saying, we'll just go say this. It has to be true to who you are, how you live, how you behave, uh, how you interact with your customers. Because if you haven't, uh, your audiences will see through it in a heartbeat, right? And the most important audience is your, are your employees. If you don't start brand positioning from the inside out, and you haven't got your employees bought in, it's going to fail because they're the ones who deliver on that promise. So as companies and big brands are thinking through this, uh, a key stakeholder and important audience, you have to always start this with is, is with employees. So let's say you've gone through all this, you've figured out your audience, you've got your positioning, uh, now you're starting to do the storytelling and you're developing content. Uh, that in itself has its own set of challenges, right? These days with attention spans and, and how do you simplify content? How do you get out of this media clutter? Uh, you're trying to get in a very consistent way, a message across the globe. 
Um, and then you're still trying to tailor things for a unique geography or a unique market or a unique country, but yet you've got to stay true to what the brand is at, at, at a corporate level. Uh, so these are again things that you need to think through. Uh, and then the last one is 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 just emotional storytelling. Um, coming back to the topic of what this 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 whole uh, you know where we started was the digital age. If you think about social media channels that have really done well over the last decade, right? Instagram, YouTube, we are moving more and more visual. We are moving more and more to video. And that's how things are being consumed. So how you tell stories, how you say it, do it you know, succinctly and uh, leave behind key messages is, is, is a critical uh, element to your kind of brand positioning. What is your purpose? What's your mission? Um, and, and getting beyond just you know, features of products or you know, getting into uh, pricing and you know, uh, things that are just uh, the, the product level stuff. It's the, the higher level brand benefits and purpose and mission of your company that, that, are, that are going to be important. So um, I, I've talked a lot about kind of like principles and missions and et cetera. So again, I, I, I want to kind of try and bring it to life with, with an example. Uh, and I'm not sharing anything that's proprietary. I literally went to a website and got this. So this is from a corporate website. Um, the mission is bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. That's this company's mission. Um, and they've asterisked athlete and says, if you have a body, you're an athlete, all right? They also have a purpose and they say, uh, Purpose moves us. Our purpose is to unite the world through sport, to create a healthy planet, activate communities, and an equal playing field for all. So a very high level purpose, um, and, and uh, this is kind of what they have. So can you, again, I'll just go to chat and take a look. Can you put what you believe uh, this company to be? Uh, and I think I've lost my chat screen. So let me, there we go. Nike, Decathlon, Adidas, Puma, Red Bull. <laughs> Good one. Uh, all right, uh, let's see. I'm going to go to the next slide here. So it was Nike. I think most of you got that one. Uh, this is their current campaign, where, are, where all athletes belong. Uh, they had, for the longest time, it's a company I greatly admire from a brand positioning standpoint. Uh, they had the Just Do It campaign. Uh, but it, you'll notice over the last, you know, that they have become uh, increasingly a brand that that will stand up for values uh, they're all about equality even the the thought that went into asterisk you know an athlete it doesn't matter whether you're a child you're a woman a, a man what color you are what gender what nationality whether you have, you have disabilities you are an athlete and and that's what they truly believe and and they stand behind these social issues uh, they're willing to stand behind their athletes. They, you know, there's a lot of controversy here with uh, Colin Kaepernick, and there was a big ad they did to support him. Uh, so th this is where they're standing behind their mission. They're saying this is who they are. And by the way, if anyone believes that they didn't have their controversies, you can find stories in their history that talk about the issues they've had but they've built a brand, they, they have core beliefs, and, and it allows them to come back to that North Star of who they are, what they believe in, and, and they truly have followers and brand, you know, they build loyalty, and it allows them to, to do these types of things. So I think it's a good example of a company that, that stands behind its uh, brand values. Um, Doing a quick time check here. I've got a few more slides here. Um, 
So uh, this is a uh, this is the part where you know you've now you have all of this information and okay, what do you do with it, right? Uh, so this is where the experimentation begins. Uh, and 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 again, I, I think this presentation is a good example of how visual storytelling. I, I don't need to say much. You can all look at the image and start to imagine what, what I'm about to say, right? Without even saying a thing, right? So visual storytelling is is just become so critical these days. Um, the point I'm trying to make on here is with all that I've kind of gone through, is uh, this idea of uh, it's not just the soft side of marketing, right? There's, there's a lot of science. That, that's the beauty of brand and marketing overall is it's, it's equal part art and equal part science. Uh, you have to start with research, right? So you, it's all about perceptions in people's minds. I asked you questions. Uh, you're going to ask your audiences the same questions. Brand marketers always do this. You have to, you anchor it in research. Who, who do you, you know, what do you think about our brand, our product, uh, you, have, you need to have a clean baseline to understand where you stand today so that you know what perceptions you're trying to shift uh, so that you can, you, know, you can take them to another place in what you're trying to educate them about. Um, so market research for me, and it's kind of my core competency through all my 20 years is, is where it started. Uh, and and it, it's, it's helped me, it's become a, a critical tool in my kind of marketing toolbox. No matter what job I was doing, whether it was loyalty, whether it was e-commerce, research is a, is a key component. Uh, and it has its flaws, it has its issues, it has, you have to be really careful with it. It's a dangerous tool as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the example of, uh, uh, you know, political polls. I mean, I, it's a form of research, but we've all seen how, you know, the world missed uh, a, a lot of it in a lot of economies, right? We, we thought we had it, and then the results were just completely different than what we expected. So you have to be very careful with research. It's, it's a tool that has to be done very carefully. You know who you're talking to, uh, back to the audiences, right? You want to hear from the people you need to hear from. Like I, I often get this comment about, you know, like beer commercials and people say, ah, I don't get that, I, I didn't like it. Well, you're not the target audience, right? If you're not the target audience, that company or that brand doesn't care. So uh, be careful with who you're talking to, ask them the right questions, right? Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, saying garbage in garbage out if you ask the right questions to the wrong people or the wrong people the right questions you're going to come out with uh, completely different answers so good disciplined research is critical the second point is alignment and buy-in you you really have to uh, make sure that there's alignment at the leadership levels inside a company and with employees i said that before uh, before you go outside in a big way if you haven't got their buy-in it'll fall flat. So you have to really have good solid. And here too, you're never going to get to 100%. There are always going to be detractors. There are always going to be people who don't believe in it completely. But you have to listen. You have to kind of take their points into account and do the best you can to, to kind of be representative of who you are, be authentic. Data and analytics goes without saying, all of you are brilliant. Uh, you know, you're at IAM for a reason. Uh, you have to use data and analytics to, to help you steer to the right decisions. And these days with, you know, loyalty marketing, e-commerce, uh, social media, you're getting data all the time. So make your decisions based on uh, what, you're, what you're seeing. And test and learn, right? It's a continuously evolving space. You're going to learn things. Uh, you're going to test things. Some things are going to fail, like that image there. Something's going to blow up. Uh, or you're going to learn some nugget of information that says your audience is really like this um, or this length of video. You know, we get uh, brand marketers tend to get enamored with long videos, right? And so guess what? There's enough data to show people are not watching beyond a minute or two minutes, right? So as much as we believe we've got this wonderful story to tell, if you're not saying it quickly, they're gone. So uh, yet there are those 
there are some topics where uh, you know long form videos work. So it all becomes a game of return on investment. How much are you going to willing to put in to get that extract that with that very special audience? So all of these are factors that you need to take into account. Uh, so I'm going to kind of quickly go through two examples. Uh, the first one is from Boeing. Uh, and I, I, I want to give you this example more as a, uh, it's the brand thinking that went into, uh, this is about the Paris Air Show in 2015. I'm not sure many of you have seen this video. Uh, if you haven't, I'll, I'll make sure Yasho, someone gets the link to these videos and you can share it if, if you want. Um, and you can take a look at it. You can just do uh, 787 Dreamliner and YouTube, you'll find it. Uh, and I, I'll put it in chat at the end of this uh, session. Um, we had a unique opportunity to kind of, uh, this is a, an industry event, right? This is when the world comes together in Paris every other year for a big air show. And, and we had a way to kind of tell that story through showing and showcasing to the world because the world can come to Paris. And so in this digital space, how do you kind of showcase your products? The airplane was going to do its show routine in Paris. So we said, let's film it. And it's, it's not that it was new, it had already been done in 2014, but we said, how can we improve it? And so we looked for ways to raise the bar. We got a great video we've produced, uh, you know, we got the camera angle in the right place, this famous rocket shot, which makes it look like it's coming straight at you. Um, and, and it went viral on YouTube. And we had deliberately at that point in time said, okay, it's gonna be a YouTube video. We put it on many channels, uh, other social media channels in China, we had it in their distinct channels. And we didn't know what to expect. We knew we had done our best in planning it, thinking through how do you simplify? So the bottom left is we want to get to a global audience, right? So think about when you're talking to one message. So there's no words in here. It's just set to music. And, and that's all it is. It's raw emotion. Aviation enthusiasts was our target. And, and it went viral. Within hours, it was a million views, two million views. And if any of you have been a part of a project like that, it's, it's great to watch this kind of come to life and you see something going viral within hours, it's at millions. Um, I was on my way to Paris in, in London in, in the lounge. I could hear it on people's phones. The, the music is very distinct and I could see that it was catching on fire because Frequent flyers were listening to it, right? So uh, it's a great feeling when that happens and, and you've connected with your audience and it's truly gone viral. Back to the points I'd made about authenticity and humanizing. Again, this is an incredible piece of machinery doing incredible things, right? It's millions of parts flying and doing incredible things. How do you tell the story behind it? So we augmented it with a second video a behind the scenes video that had GoPro cameras inside the cockpit. We had you know, interviews with the pilots. There's a lot of skill to fly these things. So hearing from the people who fly it, the pilots, uh, you know, their stories uh, was added another whole dimension to this original video. And so we kind of extended what, what we were doing. Uh, and I just use this as an example to kind of bring it back to all this, those things that I talked about, you know, authentic, emotional storytelling, knowing your audiences, uh, targeting them for the channels they, they view things in. And then the last one uh, is, is uh, you know, we've been talking very high level, big brands, Tata's and, you know, all these, uh, the big brands. And, what I thought I'd share with you is taking it down to a, a very personal level. So here's a story from my own experience over the last, I think this is the last two months. Uh, this is a small company. It's a tech startup out of um, Norway, I believe, uh, called Remarkable, all right? And, and bottom line is they have this cool new product, right? They have uh, for those of you who love paper, I love paper. I love to write, right? It's my way of thinking. I doodle, I draw, I write. Uh, and the, the downside of it is I have tons of notebooks. 
from every job, every place. I take notes. That's how I remember. It's how I think. And um, the problem with that is what you wrote, you know, two years ago, maybe a great idea. You can't really put it all together. You've lost that notebook. It's sitting in a box somewhere. So I like note taking, but, and you can do it on an iPad and all that. But this one is supposedly the thinnest tablet ever created. And they have a paper feel. You, the sound of paper, this is what they say. Okay, I haven't seen the product. But here's the incredible brand positioning and marketing they've done, right? They targeted me on Instagram with an ad. And I said, okay, I'll go find out more about it. I did my research, I went to their website. I watched their videos. I looked at, you know, uh, I read about it. Uh, I, they have, you know, great um, third party endorsements, right? So when you talk about trust, you've got TechCrunch, Mashable, you know, they've got all these uh, third parties who endorse them and say, yeah, it's, we've done some product testing. The kicker here is that the product's not out yet. They want you to pre order it and it's going to come in November. But Everything about their brand positioning tells me there's quality behind it. Their website tells a clean story, explains everything. I had no questions after you go through the website. I knew exactly. I, I said, I want this product. I want to pay money for it. I'm willing to pre-order it. Uh, so this is a, I say this because it, it works at every level. This is a small tech startup out of Norway. Uh, I've given them my pre-order money. I'm in the middle of a brand promise. I'm going to see if they're going to keep it, right? So by November, uh, I'll see if the product comes. I'll see if it works. And uh, they've promised to give me my money back if I don't like it. Uh, but I, what I love is they've, they've just done a brilliant job with brand marketing. And I think the message here is it doesn't work for just big brands, big budgets. Uh, this is a sounds like a tech startup scrappy but very elegant branding very elegant positioning a clean story uh that left me with no questions i went through the whole site read everything watched their videos um and i was convinced i didn't need anything more and i think this is a good case study for any of you who are going to go to entrepreneurial starting your own companies Think through this, look at these types of examples, uh, connecting with your audience. You know, the fact that they found me on Instagram, I'm sure they targeted me. I must be in some demo. I must be in something that they targeted me with this ad. Uh, otherwise, I would have never heard about them. They don't do broad-based advertising. So I just use that as a final example. And then I'll close it with, uh, you know, at the end of the day, all about all of this is about differentiation. <laughs> And it's, it's um, there's a little bit of feedback here, but uh, the, the only point I'm making here is, you know, you have to be authentic, be yourself, uh, brand positioning, people will see through when you're not yourself, right? You have to be yourself. Uh, and, and that's when brand really lives the best is when you're truly authentic uh, and, and stay true to yourself. I think that's, that's when brands succeed. So with that, I think I've gone over by a couple of minutes, but uh, I'm open to taking any questions you may have.